So, hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about incremental static regeneration for Angular and how it improves the TTFB metric. We'll learn what that is later. So, first, I'm Inia. I'm a software engineer working at Pushbase. I tweet a lot, hype about Angular. Uh, let's say share the latest news, signals, and all that stuff there. I write posts on Medium, like for performance, like internal Angular stuff, and stuff like that. Then, of course, I love open source, so you can also find me on GitHub, and where I, let's say, push all my code. So, raise your hands, please, if you have worked with these types of websites. E-commerce, landing sites, blog sites, new sites, Nice, nice. So around seven, seventy percent, great. Right? So all these types of websites have some, let's say, common things and needs. Like they need to be optimized for search engines like Google, Bing, also for social media like Facebook, Twitter, and other things like that. But they also need to be served fast because let's say, let's say for example on e-commerce it needs to be served fast in order for the clients to go there, open the site fast, purchase it and let's say to have a low bounce rate. That is the percentage of the users that leave the site after let's say the first view. Then of course they need to be up to date so they don't, let's say they shouldn't show old data or stale data. Like e-commerce may change prices for products all the time but if they show, let's say, an old price, let's say it, it's a problem for the e-commerce. So what Angular has to offer for these things? Angular offers these kinds of, let's say, renderings, that is like client-side rendering, static-side generation, and also server-side rendering. And the last two, let's say, are uh, supported by Angular Universal that we have to additionally add. That's easy to do, but if you have worked with this, let's say, type of website, you probably have heard of Universal and know what that is, so I'm not going to touch that part. So, we know that client-side rendering, it's not SEO friendly, because it has like uh, no content on the index HTML when it's first loaded, and the search crawlers cannot, let's say, read its data. But they can be cached on CDN and be served fast, so they can be served fast, and that's a good thing. And the content will be always up to date because that will be fetched on the client side. So when the user opens the page, then he, uh, let's say, fetches the data for that part. Then we have static side generation, that is, let's say, SEO friendly, because on static side we build those on build time those pages, then the crawler can read the HTML and extract the data they need. They can be cached on CDN, so they can be served fast because they're just static files. But the problem with static site generation is, is the part where they have all data. They are not updated if they are not rebuilt and redeployed. And that part right there, it's not a good thing. It's like a slow one. Then we have server-side rendering, and just like static site generation, it is self-friendly site, but also the content will always be up to date because for every user we will have like, uh, let's say, a new connection on the server that will uh, fetch the API, uh, sorry, fetch the data from the APIs, and then of course render the page and serve it to the user. Also, the site will be server rendered for each visitor and. This is not something that we like so much, so let's see it again. So we have client-side rendering, it sucks at SEO, so we just put a line there. Static side generation, not up to date, problem. And then we have server-side rendering with a yellow part there because, let's say, it has some problems and we will understand it from a metric. And that metric is called time to first byte the first thing that we read on the first slide. And what time to, fir to first byte is? It's the metric that measures the time between, let's say, the request for a resource, in our case the document, and when the first byte of that response begins to arrive. So the time it takes the document part, or the first, let's say, uh, call to the server to arrive. And it has like some opinions like the, a good time to first byte is like 18 uh, 800 milliseconds and a poor one is like more than 1,080. 800, sorry. 
So you probably all have opened the network request. I know that you can't see, so let me zoom a bit. So let's say the first one is like the document. So the first row on every web page is the document part. So and it has like some uh, has some fields like queued at or queuing or stale or DNS lookup, SSL, request sent and waiting for server response and then content download. All this is the time that it takes the document file, like the index HTML that we know, to arrive to the client. But this is not so easily, let's say, explainable. So this is converted to an animated one. So this is the time to first byte on client-side rendering. As we see here, the first part is, so the first column is like time to first byte, the second one is the resource load delay, and the third one is the load time it takes for the page, for the other parts that are left. So for the, as we can see on the second column, on the resource delay, we have like there the documents, so the blue uh, ribbon, then we have the start sheets that are loaded, then we have the scripts, and as you can see, after the scripts, there's that uh, gray uh, box, and that is like when we make the API calls, so the data of the site. Then after that, we may need, for example, to load other data, like if we are uh, opening a site, it needs some data, then it has to lazy load some other routes, then it can do another script stuff. Anyway, then we have the load time. But when we move to the server-side part, so when we try to server-side render that application, what happens is that the part that is done on the client, so on the browser, let's say that part moves to the server. So as you can see, we have the document, style sheet, scripting, data, and other scripting, then that part, let's say, moves sorry, moves to the server, and then we have like, we have to, let's say, grab the style sheet on the server, grab the data on the server, as you can see, and then other scripts. So we have to run that part again on the server. Also, you see that red box right there? That is the data that is being fetched again. So if we don't use something like transfer state, we, we are doing double fetching for every API call that we do on the server. But if we use the server side state, sorry, the transfer state, that data, let's say, will move on the, let's say, on the beginning of the resource loading time. <coughs> sorry. But anyway, for that part, like LCP and all that client side optimizations, uh, my buddy Chris will talk a bit later. Okay, so let's focus here. As we can see, there we have the style sheet, the script, the data, and all that stuff. So all this will take time. Because we have moved the responsibility to the server, and now it has more work to do, like the API calls, wait for timers to finish, like set timeout and set interval, because uh, server-side rendering depends on zone JS. And because the set timeout and set interval will not leave the zone to become stable, it will wait for them to finish, then it will became st become stable, then the server can finish the rendering. And also wait for rendering after all those things are done, and then other scripts script to finish. One second. So this will happen for every single user we get. Like, imagine, like, that's a bad thing, right? But how can we optimize it? And we know that in order to optimize stuff, like, we need to do less, that's the only way. But how to do less work with this stuff? Because we, we need to server render those stuff in order to have like SEO and all that good things. And we have like caching. We can use caching in order to cache our work that we do on the server and let's, let's say reuse it. You remember static site regeneration that we said on the, on the beginning, like caching that happens at build time? So that's great because as you can see here, all that work that we do on the server response delay, so that part right there, when we do caching, all that will be done only once at build time. You see? So like all the scripting, all the data, all of that, when the, when the user gets on the page, 
he will just get, the, let's say, the server will only just get the data from the cache and send the data, in this case, it's like the index HTML, and send it to the client. But it solves our problem. Yes, static site generation is great, but it, it introduces us to another one. So doing static site generation means we will have to build, pre-render, and deploy every time the content changes. So just like we said for the e-commerce, if we, serve, if we let's say, pre-render the e-commerce products, and we go there and change the product price because, hey, it, it has some offers, then what happens is like the user we get will get let's say old prices and that's not a good thing. So it's not optimal. So can we do better? Yes. 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 With static site generation, the rendering is done at build time. What stops us to do that at server runtime? Nothing. When the server returns the rendered HTML, we can hook there and cache it for later users. But there are only two hard things in computer science, caching validation and naming things. And we will do the caching validation with NG NGX ISR and we make that easy for you. Okay, how does it work? Before we learn how ISR work, we'll just check the diagrams for normal server-side rendering. Like we have like the users over time that do a request. There we have the Angular applications on the server side that does all the stuff. So we have the first user does a request. It goes to the application, goes to the route handler and say, okay, make all the API calls, do the rendering, all that stuff generate the HTML, and then return it back. And this will happen for all the users, every time. So all that work right there will be like, every time we need something, it will be there, and it will, let's say, force the server to do more work. Let's add caching to it, as we said. So this is a normal, let's say, uh, a basic cache implementation for server-side rendering. Like, we have the first user that requests, for example, post slash one. It goes to the route handler, and then, as you can see there, we have, we have like, a cache. Then we check if the cache exists, but because it's the first call to the, to the server, it will not exist, so it will have to, let's say, do the rendering, the API calls, and generate that HTML. After it generates it, it will grab the generated HTML and then save it to cache. And the moment that it saves, saves it to cache, then it, let's say, goes back to route handler, route, and the route handler sends it back to the user. Now, when the user, when the next user comes in, we have to see that, let's say, the cache is still here. The next user comes in, he goes to cache, and let's say, hey, cache exists. So, return it directly. And then the next user, and so on. So, all great caching works. The work is done only on the first user, all the others get the, let's say, the cached HTML. What's missing? As we said before, we miss the invalidation part. So, yeah, don't... Don't be afraid, I will explain all of it. So, with incremental static regeneration, what we do is here, as we said, we have the time, like, and here on the middle we have like this revalidate 60 seconds. Then we have the ISR implementation, like internally. So you don't have to do all of that when you use the library and all of that. Anyway, we have the first user. Let's follow the red lines. So the first user, here we have the ISR handler. So it's a class that, let's say, will, ha will help with, let's say, all of this. And what this does underneath, it will go to cache if it exists. So up there. Then because it's the first request to the route, the cache doesn't exist, so it means there's a no. Then what we have is like 
you see this big red box over here? That is like another, let's say, implementation of the library that what it does is just, hey, I have this uh, route, I want this route to be let's say server-side rendered, so it does the API calls in the rendering. Of course, it generates an HTML, but when we generate this HTML, we add some custom, let's say, data to them, like revalidation time for that route, and we will like, see it later on the demo. So, and if the revalidation is set on that route, on that HTML, in our case, of course, yes, because that's the point of the talk, we will store it on cache, and as you can see, we have the cache there. Now, when the second user comes in, as I said, let's follow the red line that is different this time. As you can see, on the cache here exists, in our case, yes. But the moment that we see that it exists, we also check its revalidation time. It's, let's say, some data that we have stored to the cache, cache HTML. And we check if it has expired or not. When do we know when cache is, is expired? Let's say we have, like, we said, like, revalidation time, 10 seconds for, for a route. Then if a user comes in, that revalidation time, let's say, is zero. Uh, the, for the first user. Let's say another user comes in after three seconds. The revalidation time is still not, uh, let's say, met because it has also seven seconds to meet. And then what happens is like when we pass 10 seconds from the last user, then we will have, the, let's say, the new page. So in our case, we have the revalidation time, it has not expired, so the second user will receive the cached HTML. Now, let's say we meet this threshold, this revalidation time of 60 seconds in our case. What happens is the user, as you can see, check if it if exists, of course it exists, it goes to the cache, then we have check revalidation time there, again, so to the red light, now yes it has expired because it has, let's say, the third user has come after 60 seconds. Then, what we do there is do the same stuff as the first user on the call. So we do the API calls, the rendering, the generated HTML, and now we have, let's say, the, does it have a validation? Of course it has, because it had before. Now we store it again in cache. So the fourth user, that, let's say, it's uh, let's say two or three seconds after the third, we will have like the same thing as the second one, like check if exists on cache, if yes, we return it directly. If the revalidation time has expired, then let's say regenerate this again. So, sorry. So what does this mean? This means that if we have like 1,000 users opening our site, the first user will, let's say, for the first user, we will regenerate it and store it in cache. And for the other 999, we will, let's say, serve the cached response. But after 60 seconds, what we'll do is we will regenerate that page again after the last user. So it means the so it means that the users after the 60 time, the first one, and all the, uh, the first one after 60 after it has passed, will receive all stale data, but all the others again will receive fresh ones. So it, it's like uh, doing things only once for a period of time. So we had this SSR delay that we had before, like all this that is done, and with the cache result we have this, let's say, only the loading of the index HTML part. So, but we have this at runtime, so we don't need to build the site, pre-render the site, or deploy the site, because all that is done at runtime. So all the caching, all the filtering, all the invalidation is done at runtime. Oh. <laughs> Let's see a demo. So for the demo, I will, let's say, use Venger. It's an open source headless e-commerce built on TypeScript and Nest. So it has like an admin and the interface ready. So let's start the 
backend. Let's start the frontend. Frontend is running Angular Universal, the default one. Great. Okay, now joining. Let's open the admin UI. So just like products page, go to edit laptop, and then. As you can see, this is taking a little time to load. So as you can see, it's just like a starter that you can use. It's easy to set up. But if we open the, as you can see, the APIs take time. And because I had to do something like, hey, delay this because it's too fast and I cannot showcase how it fixes stuff. Venture guys, great job. So let's close this. In order to configure incremental static regeneration, you just go to the server.ts file, start, let's say, or create an instance of the ISR handler that we saw on the image, where we pass the index HTML and invalidate secret token that we will see later. So this is supposed to come from the environment, not static, it's not secure, and enable logging through. We can also do environment.production, all that stuff, just set it to true. Then, what we'll have to do is, this is the default Angular server rendering stuff. Just comment this out. And we will replace it with, the, let's say, with the one from ISR here. So when we get for the every API, sorry, for the every call we make, we have on the server, we'll just, let's say, serve from cache from the ISR or just render. So it helps as a callback. Then, after we just do these two things, we go to server module and let's say add the ngx isr module dot forward. Forward helps for let's say services and interceptors, so to enable them on the server side. So this is code, as I said, that runs only on the server side, the app server module. Then here on the app routes, we can just go to a let's say route and say data revalidate ten. Let's save it. Let's open the page, the laptop. Okay, it takes time. So let's open the network again. I have selected dock here because that's the only thing we care. So let's refresh the page and you will see that as you can see 2.37 seconds what has happened let's go to elements as you can see here ISR has injected this revalidate 10 that that is the revalidate time that we put on the route now because it says 10 there if we open the, the site, refresh again, you see that? That's 35 milliseconds. It means that the index HTML now was served from cache. So we didn't have to wait 2.37 seconds. Let's refresh again, 19, 52, and all that. Maybe when you deploy the stuff, it will be a little uh, more big than this because it will have more, and this is development. But retrieving from cache, let's say, is way cheaper than, let's say, doing all the server-side uh, work. So to understand that, hey, we have this speed, I want to do the invalidation. As you can see on the elements here, we have this serve from cache, last updated. It's like 11, 20. 20. So next refresh is after 10 seconds. This will not be done by itself. So it's not like it's a set interval there that has like 10 seconds and every 10 seconds it will refresh. But it's like refresh every 10 seconds after the last user. So the work is done only once. The trigger is done only once. So to understand that it refreshes, so it invalidates its cache, let's update this. Update. So this is the product page. Come here, network, refresh. As you can see, it triggered a refresh. So the first user that comes in. So if we see here, let's say 
the page was retrieved from cache, and now they said that it was regenerated. If you go to the page again, refresh, as you can see, the cache was invalidated. Now we have another new response, but as you can see, the timing is still too low. It means that we have cache invalidation, and let's say at the route level, so we can configure it as uh, how do we like and all that stuff. And yes, I think that's the that's the, the thing. Good. So you'll say, hey, but we're still depending on a static timer. You know the validate thing. We have to do that for each route, but not good. That's why we let's say have offered this in-demand revalidation. What does that mean? It means that if we know when data changes, we can just make an API call to the node server and say, hey, please regenerate these five or four URLs, like a product pages, and then with this, we trigger whenever we want. So we don't have for that revalidate time to, let's say, to be triggered and all that stuff. All great. So. We have like also in-memory cache handler by default. It means that caching will be saved in RAM of your node server or your server. But what happens is like with uh, increasing of users, increasing of pages like e-commerce, you can have like 10,000 products and saving all their cache on memory, it's not a good thing. So we, let's say, have introduced something like a strategy pattern cache handler, like you can implement your own cache handler to save it, store it wherever you want. And that helps with, let's say, managing where you want to save the data. And by default, we, the library also exports file system and also Redis cache handler in order to save the data. And you can see their implementation on GitHub. One cool extra feature is like revalidate zero. What does that mean? Demo time. So let's say we have a contact us page. I don't know if there is one thing. Nope. Anyway, let's let's say that this page right here is something that doesn't have let let's say any data. It just stated like contact us about our marketing page and all that. And you want to build that once and you know that it's not going to change because it doesn't depend on data. Just like static site generation when we do it. So we can just say hey, revalidate zero. And this will do it for in this case for all product slugs. So what does that mean? That means that if we want a page to be like static site generation, so to be done only once, we can say, hey, put a zero there and you will cache it only the first time and all the others will have it. So this means that with ISR you can say, hey, I want to do server-side rendering all the time by not putting the revalidate there at all. You can say, I want to do static site generation at runtime by putting a zero there, so do it only once. And then we can do the cool thing, and you can say, hey, I want this page to be refreshed every like 60 seconds, or you can say one day, or depending on your use case, it's always, let's say, something that is a variable that we can know for sure. Most of the time, on with the projects where this is being used, we set it like 60 seconds, and it's all great. So, to sum up, it improves TTFB because the, the site doesn't take two seconds, so the time to first byte is always low, so it's always faster than server-side rendering. Does less work on the server, so less server resource usage, so less money spent for servers. Easy to set up and get running, you just have to do like those three things. So instantiate the ISR handler, replace the default Angular stuff, and just set the data revalidate there, and it's, that's it. It has like two invalidation strategies, so static with a set interval, and the in-demand one, so a dynamic one, so you can revalidate any time you want. It has a plugin-based cache handler, sorry. So it means that you can invalidate your own cache handler if you don't like the current ones or you have specific needs. 
it has the best of both worlds from one place, so static and dynamic, as we said, server, static side generation and server side rendering, and of course it's open source. Give it a try, and if you like it, give it a star. Those are the links for the code um, from the NPM. And the last thing is, you probably may have heard that the Angular team is working on non-destructive hydration. That probably is coming later this year. But that means that more work is going to be done on the server. Because it has now to read all the data from components and all that, create the data structure, save them on cache, and all that other scripting. So more work. So caching will always be a must in order for the page to load faster. Thanks for coming. This was it. One last thing. If you want the latest, greatest Angular news, signals, pull requests, and all that cool Angular stuff, follow me on Twitter. I share the, everything there. Thank you.